Uh, yeah, so I've got COVID, so I can't really get through a full sentence without running out of fucking breath, but we're going to try because I'm fucking bored and I'm going to make a video either way. So, if you are living today, which you probably are if you're watching this, you more than likely have heard of a dum-dum round. I think you should rest up, Leo. A dum-dum wound can be very serious. Dum -dum. What's, what's a dum-dum wound? What's it? You dum -dums? don't know? Yeah. Guy in the force got his thumb shot off by a dum-dum. Yeah. From the shock, Ow. he was dead two days later. Now, what you think a dum dum round is, and what a dum dum round actually is, is probably two different things. So, if you've seen Lethal Weapon, or if you've watched pretty much every other fucking video on YouTube about dum dum rounds, you're gonna get this fucking fanciful story about uh, rounds with an X cut in the top and bloody, uh, you fucking, uh, it'll implode you and all sorts of bloody bullshit. So let's just quickly delve into what a dum dum round is, where it came from and where that leads us to today. The short and curly of it is the British went from big calibre like the 577-450 Martini Henry, which is a fucking wide round, it's 45 calibre, solid lead projectile, and they've gone from that to a 303 projectile, and it's going a hell of a lot quicker. Now, with smokeless powder, because it's going so quick, and a small ball projectile, uh, lead tends to not really stick together that well, which is why they then had to do a jacket. Now, this jacket's made of like a nickel alloy. Uh, we're not quite at copper jackets at this point, particularly with the British 303. Now, this nickel alloy jacket is super fucking hard, and what that means is the round is then just going to penetrate straight through people and keep on going. So that doesn't deliver this, you know, knockdown power that people bloody talk about. So obviously you hit them in the heart, they're gonna fucking die. You don't hit them in the vitals, they're not gonna fucking die. So what they needed to do was come up with a way of still being able to fire these small ball projectiles super fucking quick without getting rid of your terminal performance. So what do they do? So the British at the Dum Dum Arsenal in India, what they decided to do was instead of jacketing the full round, they would leave the tip of the round exposed. So you have exposed lead, then the metal gilding jacket starts and you end up with what we would call today just a normal soft point bullet. At the time, it wasn't really a thing. We didn't have partially jacketed rounds at the time. So what it can do is it can fly down the bore, the jacket engaging the rifling, the bullet, they're not falling apart, but it still has the open end. So when it hits something, it will expand like a normal lead bullet and wonderful bloody fucking da, you can kill some people with it. Now they use this to great effect in their northwestern frontier campaigns, which is you know modern day Pakistan around there somewhere. They realized this is bloody awesome, putting big fucking holes in people. Um, it was also used to great effect in the Sudan in 1898, um, where there's quite a few accounts from medical surgeons uh, talking about you know, a small entry wound with a massive exit wound. Now, this ends up being the precursor of what we know now as hunting ammunition, which is what we're trying to get out of a hunting round, a small entry, a big exit, lots of blood, and a dead animal. So starting in 1897, we have the 303 Mark II Special, which is this round that is specially made at the Dum Dum Arsenal in India, after which we move on to the 303 Mark III, which is the same thing. It still has an exposed tip, but it's made elsewhere. And it's quickly superseded by the 303 Mark IV and Mark V, which are our hollow point bullets. So now they've continued the jacketing all the way around, but it's got a nice 2.5 millimeter opening at the top, which goes for nine millimeters deep, which allows that bullet to expand. Gets a little bit better expansion than just the normal open top uh, dum dum round. Also in 1898, we have the Webley 455 Mark III bullet, which essentially is the same thing. It's a solid lead projectile. It's a square top with a deep uh, channel bored into it. It's essentially a hollow point, but it's a, it's a solid lead hollow point. It's 218.2 grains, I believe. Let me check my notes. It is. So this is working to great effect as well. Drop a motherfuckers left, right and center. 1899 rolls around the Hague Convention where you know, countries talk about like, oh, we should fucking take, treat prisoners right and bloody that sort of shit. Um, during that convention, they realized that these rounds are a little bit inhumane because of their wounding capability because if they don't kill you, they will fuck you up. Whereas, you know, in the gentlemanly game of war, 
Uh, if you're shot, you should be incapacitated but not die, removing yourself from the war, but then also surviving and not have, you know, fucked up wounds. Or if you do get hit in the vitals, you just die. So therefore, you're not going to have, you know, armless and legless people from uh, expanding ammunition. So they outlaw any sort of expanding ammunition. So anything that's hollow point, um, open top, soft point, pretty much anything expands. So the only thing that's legal at that point from then on is full metal jacket ammunition, which is why to this day, military ammunition is full metal jacket, whereas on the civilian market, we can have pretty much anything we want because they're not being used for armed conflict. So this was passed in 1899. As of 1900, the British went, Oh, right, I will fucking get rid of them. Um, but there is reports that as late as 1901, the New Zealanders were still using it during the Second Boer War to great effect. Good on you, New Zealand. Now, there's been sensationalised media the entire time since this dum dum round was put out. We have some articles saying that we have an improvised dum dum round um, by cutting a star pattern into the head of the bullet. Um, the bullet that's in that article, that's in this British paper, is actually a 577 450, so it's a Martini Henry bullet. It's lead anyway, so that's just completely fucking useless. Um, there are stories about. Uh, you know, fucking Australian diggers in World War II using the bayonets to cut X shapes and cut off the tips of their 303 uh, Mark 7 ammunition uh, to make it, you know, a bit more bloody expandable or some shit. Um, I particularly heard that story from my grandfather many, many years ago. But it may have happened, it may not have happened. Even if it did, it's an improvised projectile. It's not a dum dum round, right? A dum dum round was that Mark II special that was made at dum dum. Now we've just taken this word and now we've applied it to fucking everything. So apparently everything's a fucking dum dum round. So where does this leave us? Uh, the dum dum round was an interim round that was introduced in 1897. Um, it was then surpassed rather quickly by the 303 Mark IV and the Webley pistol cartridge, the 455 Mark III. So pretty much anything that's not those fucking rounds is not a dum-dum. So even if it's hollow point or if it's got a fucking cross cut in the top, it doesn't make it a fucking dum-dum. It makes it a fucking round that's been modified. And it's not just the cross cut on the top, which has apparently re-emerged in like the 60s through the 80s where people started cutting rounds in and, oh, it's a mob thing. And they may have started reusing the name dum-dum, but it doesn't make it a fucking dum-dum round. It makes you a fucking dum-dum. That's the history of the dum-dum. Hope you got something out of that, and I'll see you next video. Hurry.